Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? And if you want to do an introduction of yourself for us, that'd be great. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, lovely to see everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming today. Um, my name is Lee Edwards. I'm a professor of strategic communications and public engagement here at the LSE in London. Um, I've been working in public relations for 15 years, 16 years. I graduated in 2007 from the University of um, the Leeds Metropolitan University up in Leeds in the north of England. In the middle of England. Um, and my focus in particular is on the way that power operates in and through public relations, although that's kind of extended a little bit more into the arena of public engagement in more recent years. So um, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to, to speak. It's really lovely to be mm -hmm. here. And I, as, as, as Michael said, I've watched a few of the previous talks, um, and I know that the kind of the, the talks are envisaged to be a bit more discursive, a bit more kind of, you know, we're among peers, we're all scholars. So I've prepared a talk, uh, but, and I was going to kind of just do short bits and then chat and short bits and then chat, but actually in terms of the way that I've structured it, it, it doesn't necessarily work quite so well that way. But what I would suggest is that as I talk, um, if people have questions, you know, just raise a hand and we can break and talk, you know, uh, break and chat. Um, so, so I wanted to reflect in this talk a bit about what the const when we say the constitutive power of public relations, organizational communication scholars have this very long tradition of the constitutive power of communication, um, of course, and, and, and many of you will know that. But if we talk about the constitutive power of public relations, I really wanted to think a bit more in this talk about what that means for us as people living in community with each other as citizens in public life and of course as researchers with an interest in in this field and so I, i've structured this in a number of stages first of all i kind of go back to basics and uh, think about the implications of understanding pr as a social actor rather than primarily an organizational function and i explain a bit more about my approach uh, to the discipline and then i extend that to the idea of thinking through the constitutive force of PR um, through the lens of the visibility, the regime of visibility and circulation that I wrote about recently with um, a colleague here, Cesar Jimenez Martinez. And, um, and then I use borders as an example of how this works in practice. So if I start with the field of public relations research um, and also perhaps public relations in practice, um, I think thinking about the discipline through a critical socio-cultural lens is still is not completely marginalised, but it's still a minority interest in the field. I think there's still a fairly dominant um, focus on how organisations use public relations to achieve their goals. Um, and in that kind of work, the impact of that work on society tends to be a secondary concern in terms of the fact that in terms of the way it puts society at the centre rather than as a secondary interest from the organisation. Um, so it's not completely ignored and there's a very kind of open sense of the organisation as a social actor, but nonetheless, in terms of this kind of framing, the organisational interests are the priority. Um, and so public relations in that context is considered as a bit more of a neutral tool, a channel, a channel uh, that transports messages from organisation to audience, and is also very normalized and normal. So we now expect organizations to communicate with us. We expect organizations to take us seriously as audiences, and we expect them to be authentic in their communication and we critique them if they're not authentic. We want them to be real, if you like. Um, but I think that if we take all these activities too much for granted, and if we, if we don't interrogate uh, the, the power of public relations or, or what public relations is actually doing in and of itself rather than on behalf of organisations, then I think the risk is that we stop asking exactly what is happening in the world when we use um, these tools and techniques. And yet there's a lot of work in the um, wider field of media and communications, in, in the scholarship on promotional culture and promotional industries, on the data industries, um, that shows that the way PR techniques uh, have been used has significant effects, of course, on the way that we think about the world, on the way that the world is structured for us, and on the ways that we understand the world over and above the ways in which we relate to organizations. And, and that also then, turns into narratives about the ways we should or could see others and the other as well, of course. Um, 
And indeed, the whole point of PR work is to change the way that people think about each other as well as about organisations, because an organisation can only achieve its goal, I would argue, if it constructs a world in which those goals make sense. And sometimes that also means changing the ways that we relate to each other and not just to uh, the organisation itself. So the issues that organisations care about, they need to persuade us that they are something we should also care about. And sometimes those things are society based rather than their own products or services. So sustainability, the environment, indigenous rights, the merits of the oil and extractive industries, the necessity of war is a big theme here in, in the UK and the US, of course, at the moment with the war in Ukraine, or even something as basic as the fact that we need mobility to, to be able to manage our lives, we need mobile access, etc. So the days of telling audiences simply that loyalty to an organisation and its products or services are in their interests are long gone, I think, and they may indeed not even ever have existed, really. So the critical socio-cultural approach to PR engages directly with this reality of public relations. It goes beyond the organisation to look at the ideological work that PR does in society, changing or reinforcing cultural and social norms, the relationships that we build with each other based on those norms, and ultimately reorienting or consolidating the power relations that structure society. So while the organisation remains the originator in most cases of communication, although we could talk about that because there's, there's a, a bit of new thinking going on around that principle, if you like, um, uh, nonetheless, the, 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 the questions that are asked become different kinds of questions. Um, and a socio-cultural approach then, the, the questions come from rather, the different assumptions that underpin the socio-cultural approach. And, and there's, I've set these out in previous writing, but just to recap them, um, there are five really. Um, first of all, that there are many different standpoints for understanding public relations, and they're not limited to the organization. That public relations is shaped by the cultures and societies in which it operates, and not only by the interests of the organization that public relations has the power to intervene in societies and cultures also in ways that aren't necessarily anticipated by the PR practitioners or the organizations. And it has therefore the power to generate change. The effects of PR have social and cultural outcomes and those should therefore be taken into account by practice and by researchers, oh, not over and above, but alongside organizational and economic outcomes. And um, the most fundamental, perhaps, that public relations is not neutral, but is value driven. So it's ideological. It's based in a, in a certain type of world. And people have written previously, um, many of the people on this screen included, about the fact that it, you know, it tends to be embedded in democratic environments where there is a free press. Um, it tends to be focused on what well, thrives in a market marketized environment. So there are lots of kind of you know ideological underpinnings, if you like, for a successful PR industry that I think we also need to recognize. But within that world, it can also then be used for both dominance um, and resistance and spaces in between. Indeed. So I think as scholars, these principles lead us to different research approaches. Um, Rose approaches that interrogate, in the end, the contingency and uncertainty of PR effects rather than predicting outcomes. So this linear model of, you know, A to B kind of in terms of communication processes is, is put by the wayside, if you like, put, put to one side, if you like. Um, and the so there's the idea of contingency and uncertainty because of this kind of sociological so, or societal, sorry, reality of PR, the fact that the organization, if we if we follow that principle, the organization cannot own the communication. It is communication that is somehow co-created and, and evolves differently because of all of the other people involved in its production of meaning. And, and correspondingly, then, we have to think about questions that examine the mutual influence of public relations, culture and society, rather than assuming a one way influence or a unidirectional influ influence from PR outwards. And alongside that, then we have to think about the fluidity of PR as a mechanism of circulation as well as communication. So in here, I'm thinking about the datafied society where circulation is really fundamental to maintaining visibility and impact for communications practices. And if we if we think about the importance of circulation, there's lots and lots of different ways in which circulation 
is thought about at the very beginning of PR campaigns um, and always has been actually this idea of sending communication out, making sure that people pick it up and pass it on has been you know, part of PR practice for such a long time. But but I think it needs to be drawn out a little bit more. Um, all of those things then lead us to a space uh, where we might open up um, the definition of public relations as, as, as well as how we might think about it. And um, in 2012, I defined PR as a flow of purposive communication um, produced on behalf of individuals and formally uh, constituted and informally constituted groups. That that definition, I actually haven't done much with since. And I think it's partly because it's a little bit tricky to then work with. It. I'm not quite sure what I should do with it. It's probably time given it's 11 years later. Um, but what I wanted to do with that definition is I wanted to decenter the organisation and think more about this fluidity, this um, interactivity, this uh, mutual influence and the responsiveness of the environment to PR activities uh, once they are produced. That was what I was trying to get at. And so it repositioned, if you like, uh, public relations, I think, as a discursive intervention, with also with material consequences. So I was very keen to highlight the fact that while much of our analyses of communication focuses on the way th we think and the way we construct messages and send those messages out into the world, part of the impact also is the material impact that those messages have and the shifts in thinking have um, that has profound effects on the ways that we live. It might, you know, for example, in the, in the UK at the moment, it might extend extraction of coal in a world where that should be the last thing that we're doing. It might extend a war where we decide we don't want to be at war anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So these things are incredibly, incredibly powerful and very materially oriented. Um, and to some extent, those material effects, again, are, are unpredictable because we don't know how people are going to react to what we say. So there is, of course, an, an increase in, in attention paid to public relations as, as this kind of force. So Melissa Aronchik at Rutgers University has recent, uh, recently published a really important book, I think, about the history of PR and the environmental movement in the US, for example, which shows how the extractive industries used PR to shape the terms of the environmental debate, extending their reach not only to promote their own activities, but actually to reformulate the idea of the very environment. So, so to reformulate what we think about when we speak about the environment and our relationship with it, and consequently to change the activities that we then conduct to protect that environment. And of course, there are many other examples of this kind of thing. So she's like Tyndall, Vardaman, Logan, there are many people, um, Weimer, he's, you know, many people in this, in this screen as well, who critically analyze the importance of this PR work in society and looked at how it um, influences the relationships between marginalized communities and the center, including LGBTQ plus racialized, gendered um, and classed uh, groups, although I think class is probably a bit under-researched. Um, and there are lots of other people beyond the field of PR who are doing work relevant to what we're doing. So Webster's Marketplace of Attention, Jody Dean's idea of communicative capitalism, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, Sarah Benet Weiser's theorizations on branding and feminism and believability, and the growing work on data promotion and social justice by many, many authors, all of which recognize the importance of promotional communication, even if they don't necessarily explicitly talk about public relations. So this kind of critical work is vital, I think, to sustaining this reoriented approach to public relations in a way that engages with society in a more profound and a more responsible way. But as, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I think a consequence of the approach, and this goes back to why I haven't done anything with the, um, with the definition, is that it invites us into what I think is quite an ambivalent space, because placing fluidity and change at the heart of our conceptualization of public relations simultaneously involves recognizing that unpredictability will characterize at least some, if not all, of its outcomes. So we might accept that public relations is a powerful sociocultural force, but that doesn't necessarily lead us to a clear understanding of its impact. In fact, it takes us to a more uncertain space, um, which means that we it's more difficult, if you like, to produce the things that academics love, like models or um, uh, you know, normative recipes for practice, that kind of thing. It's just more difficult to do that if we accept the ways that um, public relations operates in reality. So I want to take a moment to consider what this ambivalence means in relation to two different but fundamental 
aspects of promotional logic that um, underpin PR practice. And I, I'm just going to share my screen um, for this little slide. Am I doing that right? Hang on. Oh, here we go. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you can no, go on the slide, slide. Mode. Uh, yeah, get yeah. Rid of your... There you go. There we oh, hang on. It's this one. So this was a piece that came out in January um, about the promotional regime of visibility, which I was working on with, uh, as I say, Cesar Jimenez Martinez. And, and we wanted to interrogate a little bit more what it means to pursue visibility as part of public relations and promotional work. So um, We've argued that there are three different modalities of visibility in this environment. First of all, visibility as recognition, which associates being watched with empowerment. So when you're seen, when you get loads of likes, when you get loads of shares, that's a kind of a, a, an evidence, evidence of your significance, if you like, or your impact. Visibility as transient, which stresses visibility as a scarce resource. Uh, and that requires continuous work to keep it going, if you like, and visibility as an end goal, which which positions it as an end in itself rather than as a means to achieve something else. But each of these modalities modalities is categorized by ambivalence. So you might get recognition when you're visible, um, and that might provide a basis for your claims for justice and equality. And so, you know, there are huge campaigns around being visible in order to stake a claim. BLM, for example, the Me Too movement are the two obvious ones from the uh, last few years. But there are many, many others, um, including um, indigenous movements, of course, as well. And in Australia, the Uluru expert um, statement it is a kind of a, a, a repeated symbol of visibility for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as well. Uh, so you'll know it from that context, too. But recognition also then invites surveillance, it invites threats, it invites violence, both on and offline. And uh, marginalised groups that uh, that we, we know are all too familiar with this phenomenon. So an inevitable penalty and consequence of recognition is the counter side of recognition, which is pursuit and surveillance and violence. And so again, you know, here's, here's an example of ambival ambivalence. If we take transience, then visibility might be transient, a, a kind of a fleeting goal, particularly in the digital age, because things move on so quickly. Um, but it also, uh, so it has to be constantly pursued, but it also then leaves traces. And so while we we have to run after it almost in order to keep ma and maintain our visibility in order to get the recognition that we want, we might also find that that visibility actually is also sticky in certain um, environments where we would like it not to be sticky. And so these ghostly forms of visibility, for example, for brands provide reminders um, that about events that perhaps they would prefer to be forgotten. So extractive industries claims to environmental concern and action, for example, are frequently haunted by activists highlighting their past environmental disasters Institutions, for example, that highlight their positive social contributions are often challenged by publicity about their histories rooted in slavery and other forms of racism and exploitation. And we see debates about this going on um, uh, very frequently across the world. And then the third element is the idea of visibility as an end goal. And again, this may be a very appealing outcome. We like seeing ourselves visible. Brands love seeing themselves as being visible in the world. You know, the first the thinking kind of the first thing we think about when we go for coffee or when we have a soft drink. And this is a kind of a marketized presence, if you like, that links visibility to power and exposure to power, market dominance, for example. But that normative state, um, if it's pursued by other types of entities, is also a poor stand in for more powerful forms of uh, claim to justice, to voice and to material rights. So purely being visible does not guarantee that the message you have is actually heard. And so it replaced the end goal kind of focus of visibility tends to replace these visceral histories of pain with very performative statements of presence. And we see this in greenwashing, woke washing, etc. And these statements then become emptied of their ideological force that they need to really challenge uh, power hierarchies and claim the right to resistance. So it looks like it's a powerful outcome, but it's not really a powerful outcome unless it's really underpinned by other action, if you like. And then alongside visibility, um, there is circulation and public relations, as I mentioned earlier, is a crucial mechanism of circulation. 
um, particularly in a society where digitization and network structures are fundamental to communication and power. Um, and practitioners, of course, facilitate circulation, making messages and content move by manipulating these underlying architectures, often writing algorithms that will create the movement that they want. Um, and also making us want to make messages and content move. The idea of you know, the holy grail of the meme that gets circulated everywhere by your customers um, is, is perhaps the most desirable one of those, as long as the meme is positive, of course. But they foster Webster's idea of the marketplace of attention, where value emerges through these networks and connections that extend the reach of communication in time um, and across space. And organizations of all kinds you do this kind of circulatory work on Twitter feeds, Instagram, be real, and, you know, and also through offline scenarios where they might construct an event offline and then translate it to an online environment where it can circulate more widely. And again, public relations is not a neutral actor here. So choices of channel shape the way that communication is structured. They shape the way it's distributed. They affect the quality and depth and focus of the information we receive and pass on. So you can write much more on a Facebook page than you can on X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, you can do much more visually with perhaps Instagram and TikTok than you might have done uh, with Twitter yourself previously. But you can also connect those two things in this sense, I think they contribute, public relations contributes to the platformization of society and reinforces the inequalities that digital infrastructures produce. So, for example, through discriminatory algorithms, as Sophia Noble has eloquently pointed out, or through the extractive practices that Nick Caldry and Ulysses may have named data colonialism, or through the environmental impact of the data industries, um, as Benedetta Blavini has, has written about at the University of Sydney. So this, this consolidates, if you like, this work consolidates the power of different forms of communication, which has an ideological bent. Video and audio then become uh, dominant over text because of the ways that online systems are, or online communication channels are increasingly structured. And that has corresponding consequences for different groups to access or create uh, such communication and have their voices heard. So... Ambivalence is there in part in terms of the promotion of circulation for the benefit of communication, but simultaneously the ideological, um, perhaps one-sided impacts, um, or certainly complex impacts of that form of promotion. And of course, um, in addition, uh, the ambivalence arises because public relations can also be used to obstruct circulation. So activists, for example, interrupt the dominant flow of communication, they'll redirect it, they'll challenge it, reinterpret it, change the meaning. We know um, uh, brand kind of activists often distort the brand and then circulate an alternative version of the brand, for example. That's a basic example of this kind of work. But corporate organizations, of course, do the same, for example, through their use of secrecy and silence. And, and Anne Cronin and Ruman Dimitrov have both pointed this out in their work. These acts then change circulatory patterns and platforms, they push communication networks into different directions and times and spaces, and they thereby adjust hierarchies of power, not just through content, but also through the movement of communication. So through this circulatory activity, I think public relations contributes to a world where some voices are valued and some voices are not, and where those positions constantly change, where some enjoy a fundamental human right to uh, narrate their lives as equals and others have their stories obscured and where those rights constantly fluctuate as well. So if we're thinking about this kind of a more ambivalent, fluid uh, world of public relations, we can see then that it empowers and disempowers, perpetuates dominant and dominance and disrupts it, offers us new ways of seeing and speaking about the world while shutting down other perspectives. And all of this often happens simultaneously in a multifaceted way. And when we're faced with a discipline like this, I think we need to keep asking whose aspects of whose life, what aspects rather of whose lives is this work privileging? What is it making visible? What is it masking? What is it avoiding? What is it disguising? What is it privileging? And while traditional public relations scholarship and practice, and I use traditional in inverted commas there because I don't know whether that term really applies now, um, it might, that might reify organisations. Organisations themselves are also ambivalent spaces. They can also contribute to and undermine the social fabric. They can also bring us together and tear us apart. So it's essential, I think, for us as scholars to stay vigilant about the way 
public relations facilitates power in the many struggles that we're living through. So I've argued through this kind of lens that public relations has a fundamental effect on society, but I wanted to take the argument a little bit further to argue that it is constitutive of society. And what I mean by that, I'm just going to close the screen for a second. Um, is that kind of stops, just stop sharing for a moment. Um, so what I mean by this idea of constitutive um, is that just like the media and political systems and um, legal systems, education systems, these are all systems that we understand to be infrastructures through which the society that we desire um, emerges. And I think that public relations and promotional work more, more generally also brings a certain form of society into being. And this is, this is kind of something that I think happens at the macro aggregate level of the industries rather than on a micro level or on a campaign based level so it i, I wrote uh, in the past about the, the role of public relations in in democratic arrangements and and i talked about these three levels of operation that public relations works as works as and i think when we're talking about the, the work that it does to bring a certain form of society into being we have to think about this aggregate space of pr um to move away from the focus on an individual campaign being good or an individual campaign being bad, because at some point all of this work collectively has an impact. And then the balance across these two spaces of, you know, positive versus negative impact in any particular issue um, has to be addressed. So I'm, I'm arguing, if you like, that um, promotional systems and public relations as part of them don't just work on a specific given social context, but constitute an infrastructure from which society emerges. And I think, you know, for many of you here and, and perhaps people who might then watch the recording, that's not a particularly challenging idea, but I don't think it's been specific, uh, sufficiently spelled out in, in scholarship so far. And I've been prompted to think a bit more in this way by my engagement with two areas of scholarship. First of all, Anne Cronin's theorization of public relations capitalism. And she argues that the inability of neoliberal governments to deliver on the social contract by keeping us fair housed um, you know, with inadequate income, safe, for example, has led to declining levels of trust in the political sphere and a vacuum in the space that would have previously been occupied um, by, um, well, let me find my page, uh, by the social contracts, by governments, if you like. And that vacuum, uh, she, she suggests, has been colonised by corporations that promise us a form of political voice and participation, but not as citizens, more as consumers through the market. And the result is that we have a different kind of political sphere emerging, structured not only through citizenship, but also through consumerism and the market. And politics becomes constituted differently when we do that or when that happens. And the second area that's prompted this thinking is humanitarian communication. I've been teaching a course on humanitarian communication over the last couple of years, and it's been a really fascinating um, journey. And critical scholars in humanitarian communication argue that humanitarianism is not only something to be communicated, but is also structured through communication and ultimately constituted through communication. So Lily Kuliraki and Anne Vestergaard um, in their introduction to the recent handbook on humanitarian communication define it as an active force, and I'm quoting here, that renders vulnerable others into language or image with a view to inviting audiences to act upon their vulnerability. So it's pedagogical, it tells us what to care about, it's performative, um, it's a stage where identities and relationships um, are played out at all sorts of different levels. And most importantly, it constitutes its object. So it constitutes what it is to be and act in a humanitarian uh, way. So it tells us about a world that is by definition far away from our comfortable lives, but to which we are linked by our common humanity. It gives us that message. It defines the other um, in terms of difference rather than similarity suffering and victimhood rather than agency, stasis rather than mobility. And by reifying this distance between us and them and bringing that distance into being through a discursive regime that presents it as the only option for humanitarian work, humanitarian communication then creates a world in which we definitely might readily help, but where we are able to remain safe in the knowledge that these people are not us, and their lives are not our lives. So there's a division that it constructs that we then perpetuate through our own actions. 
So this idea of the constitutive alteration of political and humanitarian worlds through the promotional work of, of organisations prompted me to think a bit more about this constitutive power of communication in relation to the discipline. And I want to argue that the constitutive power of public relations relates not just to discourses as interventions, which is something well covered by scholars, but also to the promotional logics that structure practice, this idea of visibility and circulation in particular. So the constitutive power comes not only from what is said, but from the systems that put what is said to work, if you like, in a promotional environment. And so in the last part of the talk, I'll try to illustrate this argument with an example uh, of the idea, the relationship if you like, between borders and promotion. And this is something that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I've been, like all scholars, I've been trying to work on it for all summer and haven't written anything quite yet, but I'm still hoping to write it for the ICA. So if any of you review it, please pretend it wasn't me because I know it's anonymous, but if you like it, <laughs> please let it in. <laughs> um, I'll just share the screen again so you can see some of these examples. So, so this is um, the next stage, if you like. So just a, a, a bit of um, background to the idea of borders themselves. I've become interested in borders because of this humanitarian communication teaching that I've been doing. Uh, and the borders, um, many of you may be familiar with this already, but borders are a multi-billion dollar global industry. I'm, and I'm talking about the idea of national borders really here. Bordering power, and I'm taking this from the, the work of critical scholars in the humanitarian communications industry, um, border power can be understood as the hierarchical ordering of Europeans and migrants' humanity that subjects migrants to danger, controlled mobility and conditional recognition. And that's from Miria Georgiou, who works with me here at the LSE. So that it, it's not just about the material reality of a border, it's about the work the border does to sort us and, and change the way that we are understood as uh, members of humanity as we undertake different journeys. And some of the, my colleagues, Miria um, and Lily Kuliaraki, argue that bordering power is both material, so these infrastructures of walls and buildings and barbed wire and technologies, etc., as well as symbolic, developed through the production of meaning by actors at, around and beyond their actual location. So the reach of borders, it's important to remember, has to go beyond their material presence if they are to act as a deterrent to the other, undesirable, in inverted commas, um, otherwise they don't do, do their job. So borders, although they have a fixed um, location materially, they have to also discursively circulate. And I think that's what's really interesting about borders. They have this duality about them that's, um, that, that, that invites, if you like, us to think about them a bit more as promotion. And so this notion, this, uh, this need to circulate is grounded in the idea of the border as an imaginary rather than a material reality. And of course, it's import, really important to remember that those two things coexist. But what, what the promotional side of things engages with this is this idea of the border as an imaginary. And the border as an imaginary has a capacity to mobilize, to move across time and space. But only, I think, because of the promotional work and the role that underpins it and the role that that work plays in constructing, facilitating and perpetuating the imaginary border. So borders survive, I'm arguing, borders survive and are perpetuated as a powerful imaginary, not just through their discursive construction in public relations and other kinds of promotional texts, but also through this regime of visibility and the mechanism of circulation, the infrastructures of those promotional industries that enable those discourses to be seen. So I want to get a bit beyond the idea of representations of borders to thinking about how those representations move and why they're constructed in particular ways in relation to these principles of visibility and circulation. So specifically, I'm arguing these three things that you can see on the slide. Uh, promotion has a fundamental role in constituting borders, so promotion as borders, in legitimizing the work of actors at borders, promotion and borders, and in abstracting borders to promote other things, so promotion through borders. And all of these things are part of the border, I would argue, and this is where the constitutive work kind of emerges. So, for example, promotion as borders 
manifests in the form of advertising and PR campaigns that take the symbolic idea of the border and extend it in space and time to communicate border power in countries of migrant origin. And so there are lots of examples uh, of, for example, the EU funding campaigns in countries of origin for some of the, the migrant populations that, that they have decided they don't want, in inverted commas, um, where the, 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 the campaigns are designed to explain how appalling the journey of migration might be, um, how there is no certainty when people arrive, uh, that, that, that it would be a particularly successful journey, that they might die on the way, etc. And this extends the deterrent effect or the deterrent message of the border um, beyond the borders of the EU. And in the, um, in the US, this digital ad campaign was launched last year by the US Customs and Border Patrol, similar kind of idea. Um, it's targeted at migrants from Honduras and Guatemala. Uh, it's distributed via, mo and this is the, the interesting thing, I think, from my, the point of view of my argument, um, it's distributed via mobile devices, it's designed to be shared and circulated, who click through, a, to, to, through these images to a detailed uh, website with more information. Um, it's described by the uh, Customs and Border Patrol Commissioner as an important component of US government efforts to prevent tragedies and curtail irregular migration. In other words, it is a bordering practice. They see this as part of the border. So the text warn readers that they'll be detained, they'll be removed from the US, describe the dangers of uh, migration in detail, they demonize people smugglers, and generally frame illegal migration as a, a, a to the US. And I illegal in inverted commas as well, as a perilous activity that will inevitably end in disaster. So there's a discursive interweaving here of border practices with narratives of danger for those who try to cost, cross the border, and that conflates bordering power with humanitarian care. So the discourses fudge, if you like, or blur the boundaries between border as discipline and border as care. But it also creates a world, constitutes a world, where the responsibility for border safety lies with those who choose to come rather than stay away. And that responsibility is also facilitated by the fact that these messages are seen in the country of origin where people make a decision to leave. Um, and so the circulation is from not just the discourse, but the circulation of the message is really important to the constitution of the logic of that world, if you like. So the reality of inhumane border practices is then deflected onto the, or rather is, is not then, but is deflected also through these messages onto the inhuman smuggler and the border force simply enacts the law because the migration is designed, designated as illegal. And these messages are layered not only through the circulation of the message, but also through multiple forms of visibility. So images and ads and websites that feed into the need for the imaginary of the border as a deterrent to be seen in particular ways. So this layered approach, which is designed to be shared and circulated, has lots of kind of structures around it. So it has um, uh, the, the color that's used is interesting. Uh, the words that are highlighted um, are interesting. And these counter, these things counter the transient nature of visibility, the idea that you might, your message might be missed or it might not um, be picked up and um, absorbed, if you like, um, by making these things more noticeable. And they also extend the logic of the border through the layered approach, through the assumption that being seen repeatedly again and again in different contexts will consolidate the required deterrent imaginary as a reality for those people considering whether or not they move. And so I think this constitutes the symbolic power of the border into the private and the public spaces of countries outside the US beyond the material border. Um, and of course, these things are designed to be received on a mobile phone as well. So you could have this anyway. You could have this in your bathroom at, at home. You know, you, you can you can connect with it anywhere, really. Um, but it also um, constructs journeys to and through the US border as undesirable, as foolish, as a reckless encounter that endangers our loved our loved ones. And so the the world is um, becomes a world where the choice to migrate becomes a negative and irresponsible choice um, and that lens then is something that we can designate to people because they knew what they were doing before they left because they saw this message at the very beginning not not once they got to the material border so i'm arguing this this kind of work extends and circulates um, the the work of the material border 
And then promotion and borders can be seen in the work that bordering does as a vehicle for promoting agencies, technology companies and other actors whose work supports the material border. And, and not least among these are border forces themselves. We've all encountered border forces in different ways, I think. But these border forces articulate different kinds of discursive regimes in the narratives to justify their roles. So these are pages from the Australian Border Force site that I took, all, uh, took up earlier in the year. And here, bordering is transformed into a challenge of national security, national protection, administrative process, and inevitable action. Borders here exclude only those that are unlawful, who must be detained. And because borders and their forces are tightly connected in the dynamics of material bordering power, in other words, border forces are part of the material reality of borders on the ground, the promotion of one allows the other to promote itself in alignment. So constituting the symbolic border, the symbolic border in particular ways, constituting this imaginary border in particular ways, allows the border force to also be constituted in a specific way that serves its own legitimacy. So here, for example, the border is a mechanism of exclusion for the unlawful. This simultaneously constitutes the border force as an agent of security, reassuring the population and legitimate travelers. And so for, um, uh, and so for migrants who are stopped, the force is simply doing its lawful duty. It has no other choice. And the reality is in this kind of space um, of Australia's brutalizing offshore detention practices, which in February this year, as I'm sure you remember, prompted two refugees to sew their lips shut and go on hunger strike in protest of the conditions in which they were being held. They are erased and excused in a world where detention can only be a lawful practice. So the success of this promotion depends on the border being recognized as a symbol of protection and its visibility in border force narratives has to contribute to this reality. So like the border imaginary, the visibility and constitution of this particular border force has to also circulate widely and become normalized because only then can it be relied upon as a touchstone that excuses conduct when other challenging realities arise like the sewn together lips of refugees. So the, br the brutality of border power again becomes an inevitable administrative process. It's excused, be excused because it's limited to those who are not us, who are unlawful, whose narratives are not visible, and crucially, whose narratives do not circulate in the same way. So they're not able to leverage the imaginary border in the way that the border force can to create a parallel connection that allows the legitimacy to transfer from one to the other and back again. And then finally, promotion through borders relates to the ways in which the idea of the border itself is um, translated and transposed and instrumentalized to promote other things. And so here I've picked up on the idea of the strong border, which is often used as a stand in for other forms of strength. So in the UK, for example, the Home Secretary Suella Braverman has introduced the Illegal Migration Bill, and it's actually called the Illegal Migration Bill. Many people think the bill itself is illegal, but she's framed it in a slightly awkward way there, I think. This bill effectively removes all rights to arrival in the UK as an asylum seeker or a refugee, and it constitutes the border and decisions about who crosses it as a matter of national sovereignty rather than international law. So the bill has been publicised as evidence that the government is serious about tackling, in inverted commas, or eliminating, in inverted commas, small boats. And that's how uh, migrant journeys have been described. The people are removed from the description. It's just about boats. Um, the idea is that they'll reduce the number of deaths in the English Channel crossing and they'll undermine the business of people smuggling. These are the claims that are made. So the border here becomes a mechanism for the government to assert its national status and to protect migrants by stopping the smuggling business. So this strong border is made visible and circulated again through repetition. So these are things that we saw on Twitter. Um, promoted by the Prime Minister's Rishi Sunak's um, Twitter account, but also via websites, also in newspapers, and um, also on Instagram and, and multiple different platforms. Um, the message here, though, is that the border reflects a strong government. So the strong border, the turning back kind of message of boats and smugglers um, and implicitly people, is a, a an aspect of the strong government that has been constituted through this work. Ironically, um, 
And I think this is a really interesting phenomenon. And I'm not 100% certain how to make sense of it. But the fact that the policy is completely unworkable um, and has no, I mean, all none of their policies have had any visible impact on migration across the channel. Uh, this this is only just coming into, into uh, force actually so there's there's still some time for this to actually make a difference but um you know whether or not one wants it to make a difference but anyway the, the, my political views aside this this kind of uh aspect this this kind of narrative and rhetoric around the bill has completely ignored the the corresponding and ongoing challenges to the government about numbers of migration of migration that that do not be uh, haven't declined over the last 10 years while this government has been in power and if you think about that, then the question is why the policy is being produced at all. And I think here it only makes sense as a promotional tool. And this turns the border into a promotional channel and a promotional object that can be translated and instrumentalized uh, for other spaces. So in political contexts like the UK and indeed the US and in Australia, where controlling illegal migration is a, is a regular election promise, what matters is not the material reality, of the numbers of people coming into the country, but the promotional work that a strong symbolic border, a border constituted not only through discourse, sorry, a border constituted only through discourse and visibility and circulation, separated from its material reality, can do to constitute an electable government identity. So in this example here, the border becomes akin to a floating signifier, if you like, a promotional concept that's deployed in different locations to constitute different realities without being tied to any specific material form. So the constitutional power, if you like, of public relations here is transferred to other spaces through the mechanism of the border. So what I wanted to uh, use these examples for is the to illustrate really how it isn't just the discourses, but it's also the visibility and it's also the imperative of circulation um, that play an important role in the constitutive work that public relations does. And I think we can also take this one step further, going back to this idea of ambivalence that's inherent in promotional logic. I think the analysis also helps us understand when when all of these multiple ways of arguing and thinking through borders and, and articulating the symbolic border, if we take all of those at once, we can understand then also why borders and the symbolic idea of a border can never be fixed. The constitution of a border is always fragile, precisely because this regime of visibility and the um, circulatory imperative are themselves ambivalent. So when you when you operate on the basis of those logics, you build in ambivalence into the outcomes of your communication. So I'll just quickly summarize the argument before I finish in relation to borders. First of all, border recognition is essential. The border has to be understood and seen as a liminal space that should not be crossed by the other. Yet its very recognition prompts discursive and practical resistance. So in Foucauldian style, once it's constituted through promotional claims, it's open to resistance, reinterpretation and rejection. The transience of visibility means the border can never be fixed. So its constitution is inherently fluid, escaping a permanent definition and then appearing in different forms through different channels, which is then reinterpreted as audiences pass that work on. And this ultimately undermines any claim to any kind of permanence or material form. And similarly, those that rely on a transient border for their own promotional purposes can never really be fully confident that its desired constitution will remain uncon uncontested because alternative realities are always sitting on the sidelines. So their own identities are always fragile. And efforts to produce borders through endless visibility in ad campaigns that stand in for borders or in claims to strength through borders or legitimacy at borders must ultimately remain performative because they are designed to be seen and to circulate, but not to be deliberative or democratic. And they therefore lack moral and legal justification for claims to bordering power because constituting the border as a promotional object or through a promotional set of um, activities necessarily erases the detailed political and deliberative discussions of human rights and recognition demanded by migrants and NGOs who live the realities of life at border crossings. So by using the example of borders, I wanted to offer 
um, some thoughts really about how public relations as a key promotional tool can not just structure or reflect the world in which we live, but actively constitute that world through both discourse and promotional logics, promotional infrastructures, if you like, with various consequences. And if we go back to the socio-cultural perspective of PR that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk, the argument focuses attention on the connections between organisations and society by insisting that the constitutive power of public relations is tightly linked to its originators, who they are, why they're communicating, how this shapes the promotional logic that they use to communicate their messages. So this brings the organisation back in, of course. Um, but it also looks at what vulnerabilities are created in the process and ultimately what effect all this work has on society. And we shouldn't just be asking these questions about dominant groups, about large corporates, for example, and often critical work is focused heavily on large corporations, you know, as, as a source of dominant power and governments, etc. But we also have to ask the same questions of NGOs, of nonprofit organizations, of political institutions and activists, because all of us who communicate do so from a standpoint of interests rather than disconnection. We want a particular world to exist because we feel it's morally, politically, economically, or perhaps socially more acceptable than an alternative. And by highlighting the reality of all our power as potential communicators, whether it's exercised through bringing borders into being, creating trans individuals and communities as less than human, or defining homelessness, for example, as a form of state neglect rather than personal error, I think this constitutive role of public relations has to be handled with extreme care. And as scholars, we need to interrogate it constantly, if you like, to explore the broader impact that it's having and, and call people to account when necessary. So that's what I wanted to, to share. Um, I haven't actually been looking at time, so I hope I haven't talked for far too long, but I'd be interested in any thoughts or questions that people have and I'll stop sharing. Okay, great. I'm not quite sure how to stop sharing. Have I stopped sharing? No. Uh, we still have your screen up, your Zoom screen. The stop sharing button. Ah, oh, there we are. It's over here. Stop sharing. Okay. okay, great. I couldn't get my hand gestures to work. So who, who's who got questions? I got lots of stuff I could talk about. Who wants to go first? I've got one. Okay, Aaron. Um, on just towards the end there, you were talking about um, deliberative practices versus these promotional practices. Um, do you see that those two things as being um, intention or um, sort of at the deliberative practices as being a, a, something to aspire to? Or do you think the deliberative practices are just another form of promotion and of, of people, um, of groups promoting their own interests? I, I'm interested in whether you see those as sort of binary or um, as more about the complex interaction of those two things yeah that's i think that's a really interesting question actually um so the, the hamasian norm of deliberation is that you enter the deliberative space and leave your interests aside you, you leave them at the door almost um and there's a lot of really interesting work um done by the groups that um work on deliberative systems which are australian based actually i can't remember where they are i think they're at canberra john dryzek and his his uh, team uh about deliberative systems and the idea of deliberative systems is to kind of challenge if you like the Habermasian norm by arguing that deliberation takes place across all sorts of different levels and in different spaces in society and also uh to recognize the reality of this kind of interested standpoint that we all bring to our discussions and so I think the the argument there, and oh, there's a woman called Caroline, I can't remember her surname, but she's written about this specifically in relation to organisations engaging in deliberative work. Um, but the reality is that, that interests um, are part of the picture when we engage in deliberation. But the point about deliberation is to, and this, this comes back to dialogic communications, this is kind of very much more in, in Michael's arena, is to enter that space with um, an openness and a readiness to listen and learn from other partners. And of course, Margaret's written um, into the Martin Buber about these things as well. Um, but that openness and readiness to learn is part of the picture. Now, if you go in as a promotional actor and your focus is only on self-promotion, then that isn't deliberative. 
but you can go in as an actor with a certain set of interests ready for your position to change if necessary and to learn from your other partners in uh, in deliberative processes i think deliberative processes this this focus on the exchange of ideas the idea of learning about other perspectives and then coming to a conclusion which needn't necessarily be a consensus but is a more informed position is really important there's no reason why Promotion shouldn't be, and I and, and probably, probably relation but more broadly, perhaps perhaps not so directly, but promotional tools can't be used to generate that kind of outcome. Promotion doesn't have to be always about self-interest. It can also be about promoting collective interests. And so I think when you have deliberative opportunities, engaging with people in order to bring them together to discuss those collective interests is certainly something that pr the promotional industries could do. Um, but the principles of engagement are very different. And I think those would have to be acknowledged, if you like. Those would always have to be there if, you, if you're really going to talk about something that's deliberative. So it's really essentially about sharing power. So actually, uh, in your uh, example about the borders, um, there was an example in the pictures that I noticed. There was government communication, and on the other side, there was a demonstration that probably was organized not by government. And yeah. the question is the, the balance, of, balance of power. And yeah. if you can make a comment, something about your insight on the days we are now, we are, we are frustrating, frustrated watching how democracies are becoming weaker and weaker and this imbalance of power and uh, it's really uh, putting PR, you know, PR is on both sides. And as you say, it can promote or humanity and, and uh, really very positive causes, not self-interest. But on the other hand, you have the other organizations and, we live now so such a challenging time in this respect. So where are we going? Mm. Yeah, Margaret, that's such an important question, I think. And and uh, <laughs> it's yeah, horrendously depressing when you look at the world in, in some ways. I think I think the 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 problem and, and the missed opportunity, I think, is uh that the work that public relations does tends to operate in parallel rather than bringing people together. And I think that's because it, it, it feels risky to organizations and groups to, to come together with people who are so diametrically opposed to their own position. So we have, and again, I think, you know, the question has to be raised as to whether it ever existed, but we, th there is lots of collaborative and connected work happening at the local level. So we live in communities where these polarizations aren't necessarily always a reality depending on where we live of course but i think the possibilities of change are much more powerful when you can complement the the public relations work for each side with public relations work that might connect both sides to engage in this deliberative work to to foster understanding and the polarization by definition is, is, is a polarization through an absence of that, with through a refusal to discuss or, or an inability to discuss. And we know that the data structures and algorithmic structures, you know, uh, uh, exacerbate that reality because online we, we, we just see what we want to see or we just see what the algorithm thinks we're going to be interested in. And, and I think that there's a parallel danger that, you know, if the, the more and public relations is, is, is part of this process, but the more that we are driven to online communication, to online engagement, the, the fewer the possibilities are, the, the less normal it becomes to sit in a room and talk with people about stuff. So when we, um, so I work with Giles Moss at the University yeah. of Leeds on, on deliberative public engagement um, events. And we did, we did one um, a while ago on public service media and the, the value of public service media at, in the current climate, given all the changes that have happened to the media environment. And we've also done a previous one on copyright law. And the, 
you know, the assumption in both of these scenarios is that the public don't know enough and so they can't possibly talk about these complicated things. And actually the public know an awful lot about both of those topics and about, you know, all the topics that they live on a daily basis. And so I think the the sense of risk that organisations have, non-profit and also, you know, corporate, about coming together and ha and, and hammering through some of the foci, foci that they disagree on. Um, that that deters deters groups from engaging in that kind of work. Um, at the same time, there's a belief that it might not work anyway. So because you know maybe it will all go wrong because people don't have enough information or people are just going to be you know stick with stick with what they believe. And actually, if you if you set the parameters of a, of a discussion, there is a possibility for change. Um, I mean, you know, um, in, in, I was talking to a colleague of mine yesterday, in Israel, the pacifist movement is absolutely still there, but in a polarised space, there are fewer and fewer opportunities to engage, and this is a real problem. So can I, but can I really give you my, my experience in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am demonstrating. When I go to Israel, I'm in the streets demonstrating all my family is there. Mm. Um, on the other hand, you have the government that promotes a reform that is actually leading us to dictatorship and to annexation of the territories and the end of Israel. Um, so there is, a, there is a cell group that is all the time saying, oh, we are all the same family. We need to talk together. The, the president is tried to organize these dialogues. And I listen to it and I say, oh, from a public relations perspective, I am very much for dialogues. Yes, I want this to happen. But you know, in this case, I don't want it to happen. They are taking advantage of these dialogues. They don't come to this to listen. And mm -hmm. you know what? Even if they sit there for years, there is no solution. Those are two different approaches to the world. There is nothing to negotiate. It's mm. either you want to live by the laws of the Torah and the, the Bible and, and oppress women, oppress LGBT and, and, and oppress the Arabs, or you want to be part of the liberal world. That's it. There is no negotiations there. So no place for a dialogue. And I feel frustrated as a PR to say, no, I don't want this dialogue. Uh, and uh, this think, is... But I think, Margaret, the point that you're making is that that isn't dialogue, that they're not actually... It's not a dialogue, no. It, so it, they're but, just proposing... But you know, there can't be a dialogue. They, they yeah. can't reach a consensus. There should be some so, kind of... Ah, way... so, so I think the question the... then is, what's the, what's the ultimate outcome that one desires from these engagements? So you can't always reach a consensus and that's very clear and i think that then there is some theorization now around um justifications rana forced work is interesting here where he argues that you don't have to reach a consensus but you have to reach an understanding of what kind of principles everybody has to accept because if they want it for themselves they have to allow other people to have the same rights as well or the same or adopt the same principle as well so there's a slight that it, i can send you the the reference to that but um there is a difference there, I think, between because consensus is a very high standard, you know, mm -hmm. for dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if you don't reach consensus, it's failed. Well, yeah. it's not know, the goal. Really it's not the it's, goal. It's a difficult goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, can, right, I, I, can I, I take it? Sorry, can I just ask a little bit more on that? Um, when you talk about those deliberative public engagement, um, are they represent when you, and you say that people are able to participate? Are they representative of the community more broadly? And do you see a role of sort of administrative or bureaucratic literacy being a barrier to genuinely representative engagement? Um, I think representativity depends on the issue that you're dealing with. I think that principle that Harvard Mass talks about is very important. So you have to have people who are affected by it, and the deliberative system group would also argue that as well. You have to you have to be in you have to include in your deliberative space everyone who is affected by the issue. Um, I think when you say administrative and bureaucratic literacy. Do you mean their understanding of deliberative principles or do you mean their ability to recognise what representativity might mean? I think um, even with the, more so with the content of the actual uh, work, I think um, one thing I, I'm a practitioner as well and one thing I'm constantly coming up against is that we get a lot of highly educated 
um, particularly professional people participating in these optional processes, um, but people from who's um, who have a different first language, uh, people who of lower socioeconomic statuses, who for whom sitting around and coming to grips with the complexities of a you know a planning policy or something isn't something that is they're terribly familiar with. Mm. Um, has become this barrier to participation. So we we talk about participation as being this d- democratic and this this wonderful process, but in fact, it's a way of um, re reinforcing and in some cases perpetuating existing power structures. Mm. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the um, interesting so there's there's some really interesting work around um the limitations of of deliberative spaces if you like um and the exclusionary nature of them uh that's also come out of this deliberative uh, democratic kind of more recent literature um i think that perhaps this takes us back to the idea that and again it's it's kind of adding to discourse we think of deliberation particularly if we've been kind of brought up, so to speak, in the Habermasian tradition as a, as a communicative act, but it's also a structured act and a structural act. And so the conditions for deliberation are really important. And here I think organisational self-knowledge is really critical. So when you're in a place like, you know, in the UK it's the Westminster bubble, people talk about the Westminster bubble, um, you know, people just live and work in Westminster. It's a bit like working for Microsoft. It becomes this kind of, it's like every, it has its own atmosphere. Everybody kind of talks the same lingo and it's all the same, you know, the same identities in the same space. And, and you get disconnected from what's actually happening outside those spaces. And you forget, all you see is deficient other people's realities who might not be so familiar with that, who might not feel comfortable. And it doesn't even have to be people in lower socioeconomic classes. It can be, you know, we talk to to people who are engaging in deliberation about copyright. And, you know, those spaces internally, the government used to run, you know, uh, stakeholder meetings, but they tended to be dominated by copyright lawyers from large um, IP organisations or organisations that had a really significant interest in IP, the entertainment conglomerates, and then NGOs would come in who were activating, act, being activists about copyright, and they would feel like fish out of water because they didn't have the same resources to invest in those spaces, they didn't know the same language to the same extent, they didn't really know the terminology in all situations, and so it was very difficult for them. So all of those structures, I think, become barriers to, to genuine deliberation. And I think here decolonizing the idea of deliberation is really important and so for example thinking through um you know the 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 presence of marginal identities and their lives also requires us to think about how one translates then deliberative principles into a different kind of space a space that is already shaped by power so if you ask indigenous peoples in australia to come deliberate about you know the way in which water might be provided in a in a drought ridden area, then their discussion, first of all, would take a different form, a different, literally a different process, but also would be marked by the settler colonial exploitation that they've been subjected to, you know, since white Australia kind of emerged, really. And so I think the once you get into that space where you think, you know, why don't people come looking at history, looking at the situated realities of those groups of people? then become really important. The vaccine scenario around COVID was really interesting, of course, when um, where people from um, minority ethnic groups in the UK, uh, or minoritized ethnic groups in the UK, were far less likely to take up the vaccine, partly because of the uh, medical history of exploitation. Uh, and so they, they didn't trust a vaccine in the same way. Um, so yeah, those histories become really important. So I think, you know, if we start thinking about deliberative as a structured and structuring process, then you you come back to this idea of, having to build it differently in order to be genuinely inclusive. And that also then would require, of course, people from spaces who are very used to, you know, the standard deliberative environment going to spaces that are very differently managed and differently run. I mean, in in the um, in New Zealand, for example, the 
the increase in recognition of Maori uh, values and cultural rights and rituals is now really well established and has become normative, I think, Mowgli, hasn't it, in terms of organisations? Yeah, but it is again on the agenda now. We are in the election campaign and the, the neoliberal neoliberals are against all the, you know, affirmative action legislation mm. and all the all the accomplishments of, of the Labour government is going, they are going to erase it. It is very much yeah. on the agenda and their, yeah. their, their, their rhetoric is has influence. So yeah, yeah. You, you make steps yeah. ahead. Yeah, there was fantastic recognition of the Maui and the, and learning the language and, and, and compensating them. Uh, it hasn't mm-hmm. been, it is not finished. It is a working process. But we are going to go back now with the neo- new neoliberal government will will delete all these uh, accomplishments. Um, I had a question, maybe go off on a different track for a second. So I, I put your definition up earlier because I had it on my definitions handout um, that I put together last year, I think. And I so I just pulled it up and dropped it into the comments there. And in your definition you, you know, you, from the 2011 source here, right? Uh, full purpose of communication, do some behalf of individuals, etc. It's a very sort of neutral position, just describing the practice, right? It's not a, there's nothing normative there. There's no call to action um, or about what we have to do. And then in this discussion, a lot of your discussion about promotion, us as promoters, public relations is promotion. I'm uncomfortable with this notion of that, because a lot of what I would describe some of the messages about immigration and other kinds of things is propaganda, not public relations. And I understand that in wartime and in certain professions, the military and others, people essentially engage in propaganda Mm -hmm. for a living and we call it public relations. But I'm wondering if you have a position on that or how you reconcile that sort of amoral, um, we're simply sending out um, governmental messages, partisan messages, I think, as you implied earlier. Um, and that's okay, because we're not, you know, it's okay to do for the government, there's nothing wrong with that. When in fact, as we've already noted, there's all sorts of issues going on here, it's so much more complicated. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, Michael. And and thanks for that. I, I mean, I think, um, I think to some degree, it's a different object in some ways. So the the definition at the time that I was trying to, or the reason I formulated the definition in that way is that I was trying to understand how we go from the content of a campaign and the organization specific or group specific work to an understanding of what this thing is at a societal level. And so the idea of the flow was really shaped by an almost visual kind of feeling about this pipeline of communication that, you know, is constantly being populated by different different organisations, different groups, um, formally and informally, if you like, that then circulates and shapes the way that we see the world and what we do in the world. I think that within that kind of flow, if you like, or within that pipe, you can have more or less propagandistic work. You can have more or less deliberative work. Um, but I think the the issue that you're raising, and it's a very good point, is that the level of the definition is a bit different. So it's looking at different things, which means, of course, that um, you can't really use the same term to describe them because they're actually different things. So this is an aggregate thing and and the individual work is is a campaign level thing and I haven't really thought about that before so that's a really good point <laughs> yeah it's a really good point Great. I, I am gonna have to go in a couple of minutes because I have to get ready for teaching yeah, just I know. To... <laughs> but we started a little earlier Kim thought you know she probably got my original message when I said five o'clock instead of four o'clock and then I changed it and so um, oh sorry got here late anybody want to jump in Dean you got your hands up uh, uh, yeah, it was just a few minutes here. Um, this is just really um, profound to me. I mean, I really, uh, I got pages of notes. But interestingly, uh, the one I have on the top of my summary notes is the question that Margalit asked, uh, where are we going? And I think that kind of says it all. 
And, um, as, you know, with the state of the world, we're, um, uh, we skipped a lot of context here, but um, every place that I've looked at with admiration, perhaps naively thinking these people have got things figured out, uh, the, uh, society seems to work well, and it seems like it's not. Uh, one country most recently, because it was in the news just uh, yesterday, where they talked about Sweden, which they said it's in the history of Sweden, things have not been as volatile as far as like gang activity, violence, shootings, et cetera, uh, as they are right now. And my God, my heavens, I mean, uh, uh, but the state of the world is just such that I don't think we have to, with certainly this group here to talk about this, but the challenges here that I, I never, uh, uh, um, anyhow, I'll put the chase on that, but the idea of a theory of society, Hanno Hart, uh, someone I had studied for in 1978 in his book talk, you know, it all begins with the theory of society. And I think Lee, you're, uh, you um, explain that very well, but uh, just kind of the direction, like uh, and some of this disjointed, but I heard on, I think on radio, this uh, must've been a radio, uh, uh, NPR, where there's some, I think it's in UK, where now you could get a college degree major in being an influencer. I guess, oh, really? uh, yeah, and um, I just heard, you know, drive time, you know, you're paying more attention to traffic than the source of the story, but I'm pretty sure, but I mean, I'm just like, you know, the triteness, but yet how this, this points to something that is so profound in today's global society, and then something I'd uh, written, um, I can't remember the source now, it was, uh, uh, or I mean, the venue, but uh, where I, I argue with, are we coming to an end of a life cycle in public relations where, uh, and that, I think that would add some credence to what you're saying, uh, Lee, um, where we just have to sit back and say, okay, PR, uh, do we need new paradigms? Do we need new insights? Do we need new perspectives, new worldviews and everything? And I think um, without elaborating on that, I think uh, what we're doing here and what you're doing and, uh, you know, people in this group here, I think we really have to consider that program, that um, you know, mm -hmm. respect the history, but but challenge it and say, you know, is this still relevant in today's global society? Because it's um, it's really, uh, like I say, I share Marguerite's uh, very succinct. Where are we going? And uh, <laughs> boy, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, this this kind of helps me, you know, think through some of these questions. And, a question that, or not, yeah, no, it's really made me think, and actually, I think it goes back to what Michael uh, spoke about. Um, because if we take this idea of mutual influence between public relations and, and society and culture, then of course it stands to reason that the kinds of PR that you know Gruning's models emerged from and that kind of have, have evolved, if you like, over time are now changing because PR responds to, obviously the structured and structuring to use a Bordeauxian term, mm -hmm. but it also responds to the different ways in which society is operating. So if you see a society that's polarized, it's in the industry's interest to then kind of, you know, get work from the polarized environment. It, the industry will always want to survive. So then the question is, okay, what do we see, not so much, you know, organizations and their own power that's dominating uh, uh, the, the, the public relations kind of space, but what kind of work in terms of, to go back to Erin's point, in terms of deliberative versus propagandistic, what kind of work is dominating? Are we now actually, you know, teaching students about an ideal that doesn't exist when they get out there in the real world? Because when the real world, they're being asked to do propagandistic type work. Mm -hmm. yeah, because that's what delivers the industry's success and I think that's that's something perhaps that we don't really think about enough is 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 not so much you know the organization versus society kind of apparent dichotomy but the 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 quality and practices that shift and change over time also as the social and cultural environment changes. And I think the other interesting thing there, which is hugely under-researched, and, and I would love to do some ethnographic work on this, but I just haven't had the funding yet, um, is the way that the, the industry is working with data. And I remember when I first started here, this was six years ago, 
and I was trying to, you know, connect with all of the fantastic super duper agencies in London. And I did a visit to Weber, Weber Shandwick, and they uh, had a whole division that was building digital devices. They were building wearable tech in the agency. And I just came away and I was just thinking, I just can't believe they do this. And now, of course, that would have moved on hugely because it's six years ago. So understanding that space also then changes what we need to think about when we're thinking about the industry. So I think that's a really huge question. Now, perhaps a nice question to end on because it's a lovely kind of like reflective question to, to, to challenge us all, I think. Yeah, and you've got class and uh, so it's, we should probably wrap this up. I appreciate you being here for 7 a.m. on your end. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you all for, for coming. It's been a really interesting discussion. I'm sorry I went a bit longer than I should have done. I know that people had to leave. So uh, starting late was never a, <laughs> never a good uh, oh, it's fine. We had a, it's uh, Noel had to leave because he had an emergency call, we said. So uh, he would have, he's normally here till the end. But I appreciate it. All right, I'm all right, thank you very much. Lovely to see you.